Testing. Does it work? Does it work? It'll do probably the one at a time. I a little hush there. Oh, it does work. Great. Hello. Good evening. Thanks for turning out to this fans forum just a couple of days out from a brand new season, 2023-24 season, where we'll be playing in the Sky Bet Championship. Yeah, many a cheer has gone out for that one, and I don't think I'll ever get bored of saying it. So hopefully it will be a good start on Saturday and we can go on and have a great season. Um, as I said, thanks for turning out. We've got lots of questions to get through. Um, let me just introduce, not that you will probably need it, the panel alongside me today. We'll go across the line and line up order. So we've got Director of Football, Neil Jewsnip, who, not a scouser. Posh, posh one. Our Chairman, Simon Hallett, of course. And playing up front this evening is uh, our Chief Executive, Andrew Parkinson. You wondered where the new striker was coming from. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the format of today, we've got lots of, of questions and topics to get through. Loads have been sent in already. We'll also take questions from the floor as well. What we'll do is we'll kind of talk about a couple on here. We'll open it up to you guys. We've got a couple of spotters with mics. So just chuck your hand up. Uh, one of us will come and find you, and we will we'll do our best to answer it. Well, I won't, actually. These guys will. Um, so we may as well get started, shall we? Um, because there's lots to get through, as I said. So this one is for the main man, Simon Hallett. Um, and it, it is to do with investment. Good topic for you. Um, so it's around Argar Green and why a couple of them have, have pulled out of their investment with Argar. So if we go back about a year, Argar Green were issued shares, so they became 20% uh, shareholders. Uh, why it was 20% was because at that level they could have little influence, but we clearly hoped that they would grow as shareholders as the years went by. But really, we were quite careful about the amount that they were able to uh, invest initially. As it turned out, around the beginning of this year, we had a, a, a kind of disagreement about uh, strategic priorities. We kind of agreed on the general direction, but they wanted to do some things first. We wanted to prioritize other things. So we had a disagreement with Argyle Green, uh, between Argyle Green and the Argyle Board. And uh, within Argyle Green, they also had a disagreement. Some agreed with the Argyle board, and some agreed um, uh, with the managing partners of Argyle Green. So half of, just, over, just over half of them have gone separate ways. Um, I bought them, them out, and the remainder is uh, controlled by an investment group led by Nick Giannotti, who will be known to many of you and is, sits on the Argyle board. So it didn't go the way we hoped, but you know, luck luckily, we've taken a rather cautious approach on a kind of get-to-know-you basis with them. So it hasn't, in the end, done any damage. OK, well, well, we'll kind of go along and piggyback off that question. And this is one for you, Andrew. Um, so with, with that happening and the investment from those guys going and them, them not being around, how will that affect the budget? 
Um, well, fortunately, um, Simon uh, was able to um, uh, make the, the gap, as it were, um, in the contribution that we needed. So, uh, for example, on the Brickfields project, uh, which was a key investment for us, uh, Simon committed to that, and therefore there has been no impact on the budget at all uh, from that major development, and indeed on our operational budget as well. So um, there hasn't been any change to that, which makes life a little easier. On the break, Brickfield things, Andrew, then, so could you talk us through where we are with all of those and how that is going? Yeah, it's been, it's been um, it's a long time uh, in coming. So we started talking about this about three years ago. Um, what's really exciting is it, it's, a, it's a partnership, partnership with the City Council, with Argyle Community Trust, uh, with Albion, uh, the rugby club, and, w and with uh, other stakeholders and, and the football club, which of course includes uh, the major part for us, which is the academy. And we've got to a position now where we had agreement. We had um, uh, agreement from the council back in March. So that was cabinet approved. And from there, um, the finances um, are, have all been committed to. So it's an investment in totality of 26 million pounds. Uh, that comes from various different sources, but the club is committing around about 12 million pounds of, of that. So uh, we're, we're in the place now where um, first of all, we will go to planning consent in probably autumn time. Well, we will go in autumn time to, to seek planning approval. But ahead of that, some of you have may have seen that uh, the Argyle Community Trust will take over the community hub, which is at the moment the leisure centre, and they will take that over from September the 1st, which will be a really um, pivotal moment in the development of uh, the site. And um, we're looking forward to the, the next few years because uh, we will actually start, assuming we get planning approval, we'll start breaking ground in, in March next year uh, with a view to obviously time sensitive, but uh, you know, 2025 we'll, we'll have our academy on there. So really exciting. Absolutely. Um, there were lots of questions on that. That's why we started with it uh, this evening. Uh, just a reminder as well that it has been streamed today, the Fans Forum, so thanks a lot for, for tuning in back home. I know a lot of you would have put questions in for this but couldn't make it today. Uh, I thought this would be a good time to open up. First set of questions from the floor. They don't have to be related to what we've been speaking about. They could be to do with anything at all. So we've got a couple of people primed, Ali and Rob. Anyone who has a question, chuck up your hand and we'll get across to you. Here we go. Oh, hi. Oh, and you do have a microphone. Um, it's really good to see us sold out already for the home game against uh, Huddersfield. Um, obviously, on Tuesday nights and Saturdays, avoiding three o'clock kickoffs, we can watch it on Argyle TV. I know it's probably out of our control with like, the rules, but with such demand, wanting to see Argyle at the minute on such a high, is there ways moving forward? I think there's a talk about it in the past where people can still watch our goal on three o'clock on a Saturday because I'm sure many people here have tickets, but there's probably thousands out there that don't, and it's a good income for the club when we can't attend in person. So at the moment, as you say, because of the regulations, if it's at three o'clock, the only alternative is to move outside the United Kingdom or Ireland, which I did. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> um, I, it is the regulations, and you know they're. There seems to be little willingness amongst the EFL as a whole to change those regulations. We've obviously come out in public and say we fully support the ability of our fans to be able to watch Argyle any way they want. We've always believed that, e even before we hit full capacity. Um, I think with the Sky deal that comes into place next year, there will be more games available to see. So. The current feeling at the EFL is that the 3 p.m. ban is going to remain, but it's almost as if it's being eroded through, uh, particularly through the new media deal with Sky. Yeah, and the new, the new contract which uh, comes into effect uh, next year will be for four years, so um, that will be the situation for the next four years. But as Simon says, I think over time, I think the ability to be able to watch when you want and when you um, would like to come as well is 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 going to be more prevalent 
we believe, and as Simon said, is if you put a product on uh, where people want to come to the game, but also we've got a lot of supporters who may not be able to come to the game for various reasons, young, old, etc., then you should give people the ability to be able to do that. I agree. Um, yeah, exactly that. If it's sold out, you can't get any more in, so why not? I mean, it sounds common sense to us, but I guess it's not always successful. But alternatively, just go to America and maybe I can stay at yours. <laughs> <laughs> just give me a call. Have you got space? Uh, good question. Thank you very much for that. Any others percolating away? Yeah, a couple more. Go to the one at the back. Hi, um, there was a lot of animosity um, due to the flexi tickets from last season. Um, I know you've brought out Evergreen, um, which is fantastic. Um, I was thinking along the lines of, especially for fans that don't live in the vicinity of the West Country, would it be beneficial for them to get a point per Evergreen membership to help them get tickets for like away games closer to home or closer to where they live? So say like five points each month for every Evergreen membership renewal or something like that? Um, I mean, I think on point systems, uh, the way we allocate tickets is massively difficult because um, as we've just heard, we're, we're, we're dealing with, um, if you like now, which we weren't four or five years ago when 8,000 people were coming in here, uh, with a scarce resource. Um, so we can only offer so many tickets to so many people. Flexi tickets per se, I know were um, very popular and obviously offered choice to people, but also they were at a time when we needed to attract people to come into the ground as well. And obviously that has really gone. So what we, we're trying to do is give the ability for as many people to still be able to come. I know there's going to be lots of questions about tickets, but uh, whether it be discounting, whether it be young uh, young fans, et cetera, and we try and um, have a broad church for that, but trying to adjust it to individual circumstances is very, very difficult. So I take your point, but um, you know, if we had more availability, as in more capacity, we would look at those different things, but at the moment we, we can't do that. Uh, there were quite a few questions that came in regarding ticket priority. So you've kind of touched on a couple of things there. We'll come down just for a question from the floor in a minute. But but on the way priorities are done, could you tell us a little bit of more, kind of about how that gets into that research, fans consult, being consulted, etc. Um, from priority away tickets or any tickets? Any tickets. Right. So. Our general way of doing things, and we do this right throughout the club, is we consult. So we consult with fans, so we put out research, and as always, sometimes you get 30% uh, saying we should do this, 30% saying we should do that, and 30% we should do that, and you know, 10% with you know, a different. So we use research as the basis of how we do things, and then we, we obviously then from there try and um, allocate accordingly to what most people would want. It's always under review, so the circumstances in any season could change. And if I took, for example, um, away ticket allocation, which can be a sensitive subject, particularly now because we're in the championship, uh, people want to go to grounds they've not been to, etc. Now, um, on the one hand, you will have people who might want to come to the game for the first time. It's a great introduction to Argyle. Um, and may not be able to do that because, you know, it's a, what they would seem is there's there's no no tickets because fans that have been going uh, to away games um, and have gone for many away games and have been there for you know many many games uh, have got the allocation, so they would say, well, I've supported you know the club through thick and thin. Uh, the new one would want to come in, of course, and we'd want to start that journey. But I think the balance, there's a balance here. And for example, if we were saying Watford next week, um, I think the, we will probably sell out to those people who would uh, be strong away supporters. But the way you can still build up your points is if when we go to Middlesbrough, as an example, you go to that game, because I don't think necessarily we will we'll sell out that allocation, and you get your points there. So we try and balance it 
um, between the two. As I say, it's under review all the time. Okay, brilliant. Apologies if I um, asked one of the questions that was from here, but did anyone else have anything they wanted to ask? We'll come down the front. Yeah, Ali. <coughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say um, about the fans zone. Um, how's that progressing? And um, I like to come and have a few beers before the match starts with my family. And uh, I just want to know, when it's raining, there's no covers... And, you know, you, you want the people to come before the match and enjoy themselves, but there's no covers, and you're not going to get that if it's pouring down the rain. Um, I think it, it's a really good question. So over the last four or five years, um, we've tried to... Uh, we have not tried to. I think we've developed the experience for fans generally outside and inside. It's a far better proposition for people to come on a match day, enjoy the day, etc. However, we started from... <laughs> I think from quite a, a base base, if you, if you know what I mean, certainly four or five years ago, uh, the experience on the outside is nothing like you would have now. But we recognize that there are lots of things still to do. As you will notice, uh, you might have noticed outside um, uh, the Mayflower, we are putting a fan park in there for um, those people in, in the Mayf uh, To begin with, it'll be for those people in the Mayflower. Um, and that's to address um, some of the facilities um, from the from the Mayflower stand where we we need to have more facilities, so more areas to drink, uh, toilet facilities, etc. But um, in time, what we will be looking at doing is, and this is part of a, a broader plan, a longer term plan, is we've built up the um, infrastructure around the, the site, the public realm, if you like. So the land that has been acquired from, uh, which was going to be earmarked for the ice rink, will allow us the opportunity and time to be able to broaden the facilities right around the ground. Now, we can't do that overnight. We have to go in stages, but hopefully, I completely understand your point, the experience about coming in. It's in the interest of the club as well, longer dwell time, people having the experience, people coming for longer. Uh, but we can't do that overnight, and we've got to prioritise. Um, but it is absolutely on our agenda. Thank you. Um, we'll jump on the back of that, actually, because of, of what you've just been saying and that recent purchase of the land from James Brent. Um, could you talk a little bit more, Andrew, to begin with, and then I'll talk to Neil about the gym that's in there at the moment and why that's been so important, but what the plans short and long term are for that, that area. You've kind of touched uh, on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, uh, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> you know, um, we're not here, and Simon, uh, if you don't mind me saying so, is, is um, you know, at some point won't be here, but what we all want to be is good custodians uh, of the, for the club and look after the club for the future. So acquiring uh, assets, acquiring a footprint which whoever's here will be able to develop in, in the future is really important for the, f for the future of the football club. Um, we know we've got a massive opportunity, There's such a strong uh, supporter base, the club can be very big, but it's only going to be uh, big with having the facilities to be able to support it. We purchased um, what was the goals land to be able to put the Harpers five as, and, and we're running that as a five-a-side uh, football site. But in future, that gives us an opportunity to potentially develop on there. The land over there allows us also the opportunity to be able to think about the future, which could be fan park or it could be other developments. We, for example, we know we've got quite a small retail store. Could we put something on there? All of these things need to be looked at. So what we'll, we'll do in time is, is um, put a master plan together and then look at how we'll be able to develop the site, which will include everything around Home Park. In the short term, it's a gym, and I'll allow um, uh, Neil to, to go into, onto that in a second. Just, just, just before that, when Andrew says develop, it will be to develop facilities for the football club. We're not getting into the real estate business. Don't worry about that. Before Facebook explodes with Argyle, Argyle getting into the development business. It is, though, Neil, a gym at the moment in there. That's the one thing that is in there. So talk us through that and why it's so necessary and how much has helped already so far. We're, we're going to christen it the Andrew Parkinson Gymnasium because he promised a year ago that we'd have a gym. He was close, uh, but there it is. So one of the things that Argyle is challenged with is... Uh, elite facilities 
so we have a growing elite football team that seems to be doing a little bit better. But what goes hand in hand with that is the facilities that they need to train, to maintain their standards, to improve their standards. Uh, we have been running around, as many of you would know, the, the city uh, begging, stealing, stealing, borrowing, uh, I guess, facilities all over the place. What we have now is uh, a gymnasium, which is, I guess, good enough for now. Uh, fantastic. Good enough for now. Oh. Uh, and as we continue to grow and improve, the, the facilities will need to keep up. Uh, but it's a fantastic addition to our program. Uh, it means that the players can report in the morning. They can go and prepare for their session. Uh, they, they've obviously got access to everything they need to develop their bodies uh, to help them win a game of footy on a Saturday afternoon. It's a major, major improvement. Thank you. Um, well, just to, uh, just to sort of underline what Neil was saying, I don't know if people were aware, but um, the gym that we had before was basically the concourse. So that uh, kind of underlines exactly when I mentioned about how we had to develop things and prioritise um, a gym for the footballers, professional footballers, is an absolute must. Uh, any other questions from the floor before we move on? Yes, plenty. Okay, I'll let um, Rob decide. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Um, I think uh, I've spoken to Andrew about this, but the situation with supporters being thrown out of their seats in Block 14 and obviously the other end where the Sky are putting the temporary cameras when games are being televised. I think it was Andrew I spoke to on the phone, uh, possibly, I'm not sure. No, I know. Um, well, I've spoken to three different club officials and they've all basically said there's nothing we can do. Sky is basically their, their call they need to put a camera there. So unfortunately, even though I've had that seat for 20 years, you've got to move out of it. And I've been put in the barn park end. And I've since found out that they're now, they're now selling my seat to random supporters that come up when they want to. And they'll be sat in my seat on Saturday against Huddersfield Town. I'll be sat in the barn park end. I think it's an absolute outrage. And I, and I know that there's other supporters that have been thrown out of their seats as well. And, and apparently I'm the only one that's complained about it, but I know everyone isn't happy about it. Mm. Look, um, I, well, I don't know the individual circumstances, but what I can say is that, you know, it's, uh, it's really difficult for us as well because we have demands, we have obligations on, on seats uh, and Sky, um, are obviously a financer of the of um, the EFL and the club as well, and they have ob we have obligations to meet in terms of providing them with the facilities. So at some point, um, and this happens right across all football grounds, not just at Argyle, um, there is a demand for the, for you know Sky or the, for viewing um, to be. Uh, to take up seats, and I think if we if and when we develop further. The same seat is, you know, the same seat you had, unfortunately, is not going to be necessarily be the one that you're going to have in the future. I've experienced that myself in a football ground, so I really feel for you, but I think it's really difficult to be able to, to, to manage on a, you know, a long-term basis. Yeah, but the other thing was, when I spoke to, I think it was, the, I think he was called Paul, he said that there's going to be more live games this season because we're in the championship. But last season, we managed fine. There were about six or seven live games. They allocated us a different seat for that game, but we still sat in our normal seats. And there wasn't an issue, but now they've decided that the whole 23 games of the season, we've got to be thrown out of those seats. But they're still selling my seat. I don't think it's fair. Yeah. I've been in that seat for 21 years since this ground was redeveloped. And now I've got to go and sit in the barn park end. That's not right. Well, um, and uh, and I've also suggested uh, I spoke to Bill. Is it Bill Bowler or something? The um, stadium, the health and safety guy. I've even suggested that they put a, a TV gantry outside the ground, like they've done on the centre circle. Just cut a hole in the tin, and put the camera outside the ground. Then you're not displacing. The other thing is, it's about a hundred supporters that have been displaced from the from their seats. 
It's about 100 because they clo because of the access, because they put the, cam the camera at the end of the seats, they close off about 30 or 40 seats on that block. So we're not just talking about three or four seats where the scaffolding is, we're talking about a whole section of seats and people have been thrown out of their seats. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, that is the obligation with Sky. What I, what I don't know and we'll go away and look at um, is the implication for this season. But what I would say is for next season, um, we talked before about the media rights. There will be, it'll be transformational in terms of the number of games that are going to be screened. So if it wasn't going to happen this year, it certainly would have been happening next year, unfortunately. So and okay, we're, not, we're, not, okay. we're not in control of that. Next season, okay, next season, say the worst happens and we go back down, will I be able to go back to my seat then, will I? I, I can't you know, answer that question. When there's only 9,000 back in the ground again, when they say, oh, Gary, you can go back to your seat now. Or will that seat be made available to me again? Or will I still have to stay in the barn park end? I mean, it's, I think it's really bad um, on the, the way the supporters have been treated on this. I wasn't even consulted, by the way. I came up to buy my season... I couldn't renew online. Came up to, report, came up to renew my season ticket. They said, no, your season ticket's not available anymore. That seat's gone. We have to choose another seat in the ground. Let, so let us take. Let, let, let us. Okay, I mean, I think. I, I think I get your point, and if you don't mind, let, let us take it away, and uh, we'll I have mean, a look I'm, at I it. I knew this was going to drag on because that's why I've held back. <coughs> because this is this is a real thing for me. It's, yeah. It's is really, it is it okay? It's, what's your it's name? Sorry. For me. My name's Gary. Gary. Is it it's okay if we do? Are we are able to come talk to you afterwards? We can take down details and go and and try and discuss with you afterwards. Just because there are other people that do want to ask questions. I totally understand that. It's an I, issue I, that it's an issue that can't be dealt with tonight. Yeah, yeah. But thanks, so, thanks for raising it. And no by the sounds of things, other people were in a similar position. So it is. Uh, it is a valid point, absolutely. We'll come back to some questions from the floor in just a sec, if that's all right. Um, and we'll move on to uh, another bunch of questions that came in. Simon, this is one that's directed for you around the fact that we are now in, in the championship and have achieved promotion to this level, which was said back in, in 2020, was part of this plan within five years. It's been achieved. What's the... What, what is the, the way that we're looking at it now, you, the board, the, the football management staff, as the next stage? Uh, it's something that we're thinking about right at this moment. Um, I think, if I can kind of frame it the most simple way, we said five years ago we wanted to be a sustainable championship club, and by that we meant that we wanted to be both financially stable, that our income and expenditure roughly matched, and that we wanted to have a reasonable probability of staying in the championship. I think as, as the years have gone by and the nature of the championship has changed, as the nature of League One has changed, that really does two things. It means that uh, the uh, danger uh, that accompanies a relegation back to League One is quite high. It's very hard to get out of League One. Um, and so we want to become even more certain that we're going to stay in the championship. We also want to uh, keep progressing as a club. We're an ambitious club, and I think we've proven that over the last five or six years. So if I could frame it slightly differently, I think we want to think about competing not so much in the bottom half of the championship, but in the top half of the championship. You know, I'm not going to come out and say we're going to be aiming at the Premier League, but, uh, you know, if you are competing in the top half of a division, then obviously, you know, the chances increase. What this implies for financing, for investment, for the football budget, and so on and so on and so on, is still under review. And when we've kind of come to a decision on that, we'll we'll get back to everybody. And you know, I think I think as you all know, we've been very good about communicating our mission over the last few years, and we'll do so as soon as it's clear. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on. Well, it's kind of stick, sticking with strategy a bit. Um, so we, we spoke about Argyle Green at the very top and, and investment, et cetera. So what is the strategy to ensure, Simon, that necessary investment can be attained from sources that maybe not be involved with Argyle right now, if it was necessary, if it was wanted, if it was needed? Well, I think the financing of some of the things that we're going to be needing if we're going to be successfully competing in the top half of the championship, as I said, still need to be addressed. Um, I've had a policy ever since I've been chairman of 
being perfectly happy to talk to anybody who's interested in investing in Argyle. That policy continues. Um, it's just hard to find, you know, as we found out really with our friends at Argyle Green, it's hard to find people who have the same views about how to run a club as we do. Um, we want to be a club that's financially sustainable. We want to be ambitious at the same time, but we want to be community focused, fan focused. We want to act in accordance with the values that we've been very clear about. It's very hard to find those kind of investors. So we're continuing to look. We are continuing to think about essentially how we're going to finance the next stage of Argyle's development. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Couple down here. So, right, thanks. Firstly, thanks very much for all your investments. So I've done more than any other Matt, <laughs> chairman of the club. Just <laughs> tremendous job. Thank you. Right. I'll, I'll see you later for that. You might not enjoy it later. Um, our friend's comments there, I, I do get the commercial. You know, sky's bigger than everything, so they're going to dictate, because they do give us more money. And I'm sorry, we fans are going to get pushed aside if we happen to be unlucky enough to sit in a particular seat, whether we agree with it or not. Maybe, I don't know why the club don't tell Sky, well, go and put your cameras on the pitch, because they've done it before. And they do it at other grounds around the country, yeah. where they, they, they... your own supporters can have the seats they've had for 20 years. I don't think that's an unreasonable request. They seem to just get whatever they like. Mm. Yeah, I, I said I wasn't going to ask answer any questions, but I can I can answer this a little bit. So we've made the pitch smaller here than it used to be. We yeah, so they that. do. They there are there are. I mean, again, I can't. I don't. I don't know the proper ins and outs with everything, but Sky will always have those positions. That it's one that's that they they always want. They do have cameras on the pitch as well. When they come here, you probably would have seen it I've, behind I've, goals and round here. So that happens on, on matches when they come here regardless, but they will always want those two fixed positions just because they're on the edge of the, the goal line, uh, the penalty area gives a better view across it yeah. and for offsides, etc. So yeah, I mean, we can't speak for Sky, but kind of as Andrew has said, it, it is well, I mean, thing, you it? know, unfortunately or fortunately, the way you look at it, it's part and parcel of where the game has gone now. And next year, as I say, the media deal that's been put into the EFL is the biggest that there's ever been. And for that, Sky and the, and the broadcasters obviously want certain obligations that every single club has to adhere to as being part of the EFL. So... Um, we're in a position where we're obliged to have to do that, and that that is it. Um, obviously, what we there are a number of things that came up from the uh, from Gary's question about communication, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we'll pick those up. Um, but I can tell you, it's very formulaic in exactly what we have to provide from a, a broadcasting point of view, and it has to be determined then uh, that it's determined exactly where we have to put cameras, what we where we have to put them what we're supposed to do with things like gantries, where we have um, you know, interview drops, all of those things are really prescriptive. So um, it comes with the, the, with the revenue. Okay, just a, another point then. Now you've got more land being where we were originally going to have an ice ring. Will Sky's large generators and that be parked in that area away from the public's parking out front, or will they again be occupying parking spaces? Well, I think uh, the last couple of years we've used that land. Uh, we've borrowed it, I think, of uh, James Brent in order to be put the, the trucks, etc., to do that. So on a match-by-match -match basis, that is one of the areas that we would be looking at. But it is part of the whole plan. So I think it does give us that opportunity to be able to put that in a place where it's less obtrusive to fans, so it's, well, it's, it's you know. more about getting fans into the car park. Yeah, that sure. used yeah. to have access to. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think we just need to think a little bit about the benefits that Sky bring. Yeah. I, I, I mean, on the one hand, they bring large amounts of money, and next year we're looking at around 10 million pounds. If you want a, us to be able to afford players like, you know, Whitaker, Bali Mumba, and so on, we need that revenue. So all fans benefit. The other thing that I think football 
has benefited from TV is in improving the quality of the product. The Premier League may be the best known example, but everybody said nobody's going to come to watch football games when it's on the TV. And the quality of football today is so much higher than it was before it became widely available. You know, when I was a kid, you could only watch the FA Cup final live. Everything else was match of the day. So the broadcasters cause a few problems occasionally, but they've been of tremendous benefit to the whole game. And I think sometimes we need to remember that. Okay. There you go. Whilst we're, we're kind of on the topic of a car park, a um, question has, has come in to to say, and, I, and maybe Andrew, this is one for you, is the club doing anything or have any plans to encourage uh, a local bus company to reinstate old routes, which were very well used on match days, and kind of alleviate some of those parking problems? Very timely, Charlie. Uh, as, as you'll know, we made an announcement yesterday. We're really pleased that uh, in conjunction with City Bus that we'll be able to put on some supporter buses. Uh, uh, it is on a trial basis, but we uh, undertook quite a lot of research with different fan groups to understand what people wanted. We obviously have to have a travel plan as, uh, as part of the club. Uh, we've, we, we look to be sustainable both financially, but also um, to reduce our carbon footprint as well. So uh, we've looked at how we may be able to alleviate some of the traffic problems, some of the, the um, car parking issues that we have. So that will begin the start of the season. Um, I think we've got five bus routes um, based on what fans um, uh, feedback that we we were given. But obviously what I would say is uh, for it to continue, and we've got to make sure that it is used, you know. So I'd ask everyone who's got the ability to be able to um, use one of those buses, if it's convenient, to be able to do so, so we can keep that going and in fact expand it as well. Um, one more from here before we open up again. Um, it's around uh, takeover initiatives like the DJM takeover. Um, I, this question asks, do the panel think it is a thing of the past? Takeover has always been terrific for getting youngsters in um, from struggling backgrounds to watch matches maybe for the first time. Um, this person says that the club seems focused on selling paid for experiences more, which are a little bit out of reach for many families. Um, as our full priced match tickets, for example. So thoughts on initiatives like DJM takeover and schools visits, et cetera. Well, we're absolutely committed to the whole community, first of all. So young, old, uh, and we are a community club. You know, Project 35, I think, kind of demonstrates that anyway. But DJM is a, another thing that will continue too. Um, that, that all being said, in just in terms of a, a general um, state if you like about five years ago we you know that our under 18 um support uh, was relatively relatively low in terms of season ticket holders and in terms of match day goers and uh over the last few years we've been able to grow that by four or five times in terms of the numbers so we do have a significant about 10 percent or under 18s of our supporter uh, base which went from about two or three. Um, we offer under, uh, under eights are free as well. And match days as well, we have about uh, 1,200 fans that come in who are uh, youngsters as well. So uh, I'm a bit puzzled by that question because we actually do have grown our supporter base. We see them being the future of the club, the lifeblood of the club for the future. And we've been able to demonstrate um, that we've grown that. The second part is, um, I think, on it's not just about match day; it's also about non-match day as well. And um, we look, we've looked to expand the um, um, digital platforms that we've got for people to be able to gauge, engage social media. We're not si one size fits all. And uh, again, we have lots of engagement from younger fans too. So I think, uh, on the contrary, I think we've been able to show that uh, we've been able to grow our supporter base and be able to grow it uh, to young supporters as well. How much is a season ticket for under 10s? Under 8s is free. Yeah, so uh, under 8s are free and under 10s are a tenner, I think, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, so I think that's pretty good value for a season ticket for a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, anyone else with a burning question? Lots more, yes. Um, 
last season, I think the biggest attendance we had was to 16,700, 16,800 when we played Exeter. If every seat in the stadium is taken this season, how many can we fit, can we fit in the ground? Uh, good question. It's always complicated. Um, it would be around about the same number um, because uh, whilst your capacity, the overall number of seats you may have within the stadium uh, might be more, you can't always fill them. So, for example, in the away end, we always have to have a segregation area, as you know, so between home and away, so you can't always always fill those. Um, and, um, you know, so you always have like a dividing line where we can't fill fill the seats. We also have some seats, although they're um, part of the overall capacity, that you can't actually see um, either of the two goals. So we can't actually use them for um, for football. They, they're more for events as well. So it'll be around about the 16,700 will be our maximum. And and each will have, each game will have different connotations de uh, depending on how many away supporters come, et cetera, et cetera. So if we had a very low, th the way it's maxed usually is where we have a very low away support, ba uh, away following that comes, and we're able to put all the home fans over, and we know that there's no, no risk, and the police allow us to be able to put the dividing line right up to next to the away supporters. But I think we'll find that um, more difficult this year because we'll have more away fans. Uh, so it'll be around that top that top line will be around will be around sixteen seven. Um, incidentally, I think we'll be about sixteen three this this weekend. Okay. And another question re reference the um, attendance. What's the maximum as a percentage you can actually give to season allocate to see you're actually allowed to allocate to season ticket holders? Of, is it seventy five eighty percent something like that? Um, there isn't actually a limit as far as I know, but we put a self imposed cap on that because. Uh, we could have done more, um, as re referenced by the, the fact that we've actually now got a season ticket waiting list. But as important as it has to have uh, people that come in every game, etc., it's also important to be able to attract new supporters. So we recognise the fact that we have to do both. I think it's going to be challenging, certainly in the short term, if we are selling out every week, how we grow that. But we must keep the ability to be able for new supporters, new fans to be able to come and watch, watch the game um, for the future. I'd also encourage anybody that's a season ticket holder who can't come to the game, you've got the ability now to be able to um, you know, put your ticket back if, say, you're on holiday or whatever, so that somebody else can come for that, that occasion where they might, might not be able to. Thank you very much. We'll take a couple. Just, just, just to emphasise that, I think it, it's somewhere between 8 and 10% of season ticket holders who don't come on average. So you're looking at 800 to 1,000 seats that are empty that can now be resold. So it really... That's actually quite a significant increase in capacity if four season ticket holders do uh, do uh, uh, turn their tickets in and get, and get reimbursed. More questions from roundabout? Yeah. Um, so as we get more popular as a club, as we progress, um, is there any news on expanding the ground as more people can get in and join in? Uh, with the seats? Uh, there's no news at the moment. <laughs> um, clearly, we know the places where we can increase capacity. I knew it was going to come up. We can fill in the corners. <laughs> Said it first. We can fill in the corners. We've got to do some more work on the Mayflower. And we can probably add a couple of thousand more seats in the stadium. But it's like everything. You know, we've got, we've got uh, stuff that we want to do with the gym, for Neil. Uh, we've got stuff that we'd like to do over at Harper's. We've got stuff we'd like to do. There's always ways of investing money, and I, I mean that over and above what you spend on you know, running the club on a day-to-day -day basis. If we knew we were going to get 16,700 fans at every game with a waiting list and 2,000 more people who wanted to come, if we knew they were going to come to, say, three-quarters of the game, we would fill in the corners, we'd do the upper upper tier. It would be higher up in the list of priorities. I think with what's happened over the last couple of years, as our fan base has grown, and as we're now playing in the championship, and if we are truly sustainable in the championship, I think we are gonna see higher demand for Argyle seats. So uh, it's not yet at the top of the list of priorities, but it's moving up. And I, I'm sorry to be so vague, but 
it's uh, it's a question that crops up, and it will get one, done one day, but but not not immediate, not in the immediate future. Yeah, I mean, I think j just sorry, just to add to that, I mean, I think I mentioned four or five years ago. I remember somebody saying, "What well, we fill in the corners, and we have nine thousand people coming in." So I thought, just doesn't make sense, you know. Anyway, uh, and it's only two or three years ago. We're around about twelve, so it's really grown very quickly. What we have to establish is whether or not all the things we've done around making the experience better, um, you know, people will come whatever, you know. So if we have a series of bad results, will we get 16,000 still in? And if we, if we do and people support, then we know that we've got that demand. It makes it easier. But if people don't come, then obviously you're spending several million pounds and then you've got empty seats and that's not in the interest of the football club. So what we will do is approach it in the right way. So we'll do a demand study, understand exactly how many people would come, what price they would pay, et cetera, which is also the thing we'll have to do for hospitality as well because that is sold out every week as well now. We never used to have these problems. So much easier. <laughs> Good problem to have. Uh, yeah, a couple more questions we can take from the floor before we come back in here. Rob, yeah, we'll go for you. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, a massive thank you to the fantastic three pilgrims at the front. Thank you for bringing us back to the championship. Uh, I, I run a business myself, and I look at KPIs on a daily basis, key performance indicators. And this is a question for all three of you, uh, because I'm sure you all have your unique KPIs that you look at on a daily basis. But I'm, I'm interested in the one that you look at every day, the one that really floats your boat. And maybe we'll start with Neil. Uh, the number of points that no, we will I need. You to say that. <laughs> well, you asked. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, seriously, that, that's what absolutely dictates everything we do every second of every day. Andrew? Well, having one is really, really difficult um, because everything's connected and interconnected. Um, so uh, I think if I had to choose one, though, because everything is um, it goes back to the finances of the club, um, that's absolutely critical. Um, so, you know, day in, day out, how we operate, being sustainable, doing everything in the right way is the balance sheet and the cash flow. Yeah, I, I points. <laughs> um, it actually comes club. back to what the young 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 lady was asking. I mean, ultimately, if we're doing everything right, we're financially sustainable. We're getting a fair number of points. We're doing at, more people will want to come. So ultimately, it is demand for seats. You know, we, I think we've done a fantastic job over the last five years, being more transparent, living up to our values in general getting the trust of the community, getting the trust of our fan base, developing our relationships in the business community. And it all adds up to more people wanting to come and watch Argyle. And that's a good thing. And it, I don't mean because it means more money. I mean, nobody makes any money out of this. It just means more people want to come and support our club. And that's why we do it. So to me, it all boils down to that one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've got one at the back as well. Thank you very much. Neil, th this is for you. Um, moving up to the championship now, is there scope for getting goal line technology in the park? Because uh, I'm sure I read somewhere that the championship were going for goal line and things like that. I think I think we have to have it, yeah. Oh, we have to have it, do we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. perfect. H Hawkeye. Yeah, it was, it was being installed this week, so uh, you'll have that drama on a match day. <laughs> I think there was a, qu a question down at the bottom down here. Yeah, that one does work, actually. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm going back to the buses again. But first of all, Neil, it was your birthday recently, wasn't it? Happy birthday. No, it wasn't. So, <laughs> so whoever... Misinformation. I, I've got to tell you, it's brilliant because... Where, where I, someone's brought me a bottle of wine this afternoon and I thought, <laughs> what, what's that for? So they said, it's your birthday, happy birthday. Himself. I said, I no. It was Husey again. So, no, it wasn't Husey. Uh, 
I don't know who it was, but it was just left. But if you'd like to know, it's the 13th of August. So if everybody would like to bring a bottle of wine <laughs> next week, <laughs> I... We're up in Watford, though. <laughs> uh, Southampton, Southampton. Anyway, so back to the buses. Uh, I saw the release today, and it talks about the time the buses leave. Given the new directions about how much time's added on, is that flexible? <laughs> Uh, I hope we don't get into announcements to say the number 27 is going to be going in five minutes. <laughs> I think we'll have to review it. I don't know if I can answer that question. And, and also, uh, are the, is there going to be a bus service for the evening matches? I think that's the intention, yes, that Lovely. there will be. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's for the league games, though. So I think for Carabao Cup, um, for Tuesday won't be. It's a few decades since I was a regular on the Plymouth buses, and they're always late anyway, so I don't think you need to worry. <laughs> but they won't be under the city bus. They're going to be prompt and on time. Just before we come down here, um, that's jogged my memory, actually, um, about a question for, for, for you, Neil, potentially around the new sort of directive from uh, the officials to count up more time at the end of games, and there could potentially be up to over 10 minutes sometimes, like we saw in the World Cup. So how does that sort of affect the footballing side and fitness side, etc.? Uh, we, we had a meeting about that this, this afternoon. So uh, we're advised that the games are going to last a minimum of 100 minutes. So I don't know what time you're going to go and get the bus, but... Uh, so that that's going to uh, challenge the staff in ways of when do you make your substitutions? What's the plan in where normally we'd be thinking the game's over, but it won't be. Uh, so uh, the multi-ball system is in. Uh, the, if, if a centre forward, for example, now goes in front of the goalkeeper and moves, it will be an automatic yellow card. Anybody who stands in front of the ball to slow uh, the free kick down, if you like, will be an automatic yellow card. Uh, you, you can just see what's going to happen on the first day, can't you? Uh, and, and, and you'll like this, uh, the technical area. So, uh, Mr Schumacher uh, needs to wind his neck in a little bit more. Uh, uh, otherwise, he'd be sat with us, Andrew, a bit more often. No, seriously, he's the only one who's going to allow, uh, uh, be allowed to stand. Uh, none of the other staff will be allowed to stand other than for 20 seconds. Yeah, well, set your watch. Okay. So my advice to Shuey this afternoon was, where the technical area is, if he stands on the far right corner more often, the fourth official will pretty much get fed up at some point of keep walking up. Now, Nancy's going to put his leg out as he comes across <laughs> to... And, and so on. And we had all those discussions. I, I think the point is, is uh, that the EFL are gonna, and the FA, obviously, are going to try and impose a much more uh, rigorous environment on us. And it'll challenge us as staff. It'll challenge you as supporters. Uh, but what we know through history is they don't really listen to any of us, so they'll just carry on. Are they going to ask for more money because the game... More playing time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you saw I, me, you did it all gone. I, I think there's some of uh, the uh, benefits, though. I think as a supporter, we do get frustrated with time wasting and, and so on. So I think it, a lot of it comes from a good place. So um, as an example, and as we've seen, goal line celebrations were only given a 30-second automatic extra piece of time, whereas it will be the actual time that somebody does a goal celebration for, equally with the substitutions as well. So I think, you know, um, again, speaking as a, a supporter, speeding up the game has got to be a good thing, I think. And I, actually, I heard Shui in the press conference today saying that he reckoned it would play to our advantage because we tend to be fitter than the opposition. And I note that as part of Evergreen, if people are Evergreen members, they can allocate to sports science uh, uh, as part of their subscription options. So that's where the fitness comes from. Good. Uh, any other questions from around the grounds or around the crowds? So we'll go there and then we'll come over here to you. 
Um, f firstly, thank you for everything you've done for the club. Um, I've been a fan for about, what, 20 odd years, and just looking around, it has changed massively. Um, and to be back in the championships, just absolutely amazing, especially in the financial state we are. Um, the question is, I worry that the EFL is killing football with like the financial things because you look at the state of like Blackburn, Watford, and the way they are spending money and just throwing money and not doing it strategically like how you guys are. Um, is there any way of how you guys speak to the EFL about obviously with like Argyle TV? That's a massive way how a football club can earn its own money because I'm sure there's other football clubs in our league that have got a bigger fan base who could. Obviously, have that because obviously there's no other clubs. There's no football, is there? Yeah. So, what's the actual question about uh, Argyle TV? Or that, but then I was going to just want to make a point about the finances. Yeah, My yeah. actual main question is actually about Evergreen. Um, I was season ticket holder up to last season just because obviously see the um, financial situation in the world. I couldn't afford to chuck out 500 quid where I didn't know what the price of gas and electric is. Um, now, obviously. I'm in a better financial situation. I can't get a season ticket because I'm not an Evergreen member. Um, I feel punished just because obviously I didn't get a season ticket last season. So I feel now that there's new Evergreen members that haven't probably been an Argyle fan before or, ha or want to be part of the club, which is great. But then I feel like I've been punished as a long-term supporter. And I feel like it's, it's a bit hard because obviously you want to get new fans in but you need to remember the whole fans that were here when obviously we were only getting six, seven thousand and nearly a kick away of getting booed out of the Football League. Yeah. Uh, well, season tickets were on sale. We sold more season tickets this season than we than we've they, sold. They didn't actually reach general sale for anyone who wasn't a, an ever yeah, member. Season I, tickets I, did, I, I, didn't, I didn't they? Was ex one. Existing season ticket holders were first. Then it down did it go to existing season ticket holders, then flexi ticket holders, then evergreen priority like three, then priority two, then priority one, and then on general sale. That's how I thought it worked. Yeah, well, I think we have to prioritise existing season ticket holders, I think. Um, I, but it I, comes, I, it, it comes I, back... I, I, we, I, yeah. that's, that's, not, I don't, that's not my argument. It's like existing season ticket holders and flexi ticket season ticket holders from last season. I just don't think new Evergreen members should have got a season ticket over someone who's like been punished because of the financial situation. And there's a fairer way of doing it because I've realised that I've got the same membership number from when I was 18. I'm 31 now. So why can't you just link it to like the membership number, like how like much you've done, if you know what I mean? Um, I yeah, okay. I mean, it's I, just I, a different I way of doing no, it. I, I I've understand that. Membership number, yeah. Then I've got the priority like points from like the twenty years that I've supported them, rather yeah. than then have to be now go to be an evergreen. I'm, I'm happy to come an evergreen member because I yeah. agree with the, the aspects of it, but I'll then be on the back of a waiting list again. Yeah, I get your point. It's um, it's individual it's circumstances, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, if we come down here, Robert, are you the, the guy at the front here has had his hand up for a while. If that's all right. Sorry to everybody else. Hi. A uh, bit of a positive note. Uh, I guess you heard the news about Tom Brady at Birmingham. And we probably all heard about the Wrexham success. Um, now, with Plymouth Argyle being in the championship, I believe that we are probably one of the most tempting targets for financial investment for someone who's looking to try to get to the Premier League but doesn't want to be spending three or four billion to take over a club. Uh, do you feel that's true? Do you feel you're a target? Uh, I do think that's true. Um, as I said, we're looking at ways that we can finance our slightly elevated ambitions over the next few years, and I think that um, there is a much, much wider interest in uh, clubs outside the Premier League. So, yeah, we will be looking at that, you know, well, and, and, and we are looking at it al yeah. already. But I suspect you just want somebody better looking than me. No, 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 no. No, you've done it. No, whatever happens, you've got to stay. Uh, one, one last thing. Um, when we finally get around to doing the 
the completion of the ground, the corners or whatever, please bear in mind, make the away supporters go to a quadrant in the corner, keep both goals for Argyle fans. Like all of the big clubs are doing in the Premier League and most of them will be doing the same thing in our, in our league this year. That's nice to say, our league this year. Um, but I'm sure our fans will notice that when they go away, the big clubs own both ends. Let's be a big club. Let's do the same in the future. No, no. <laughs> okay, just as a just a suggestion for the future. The, yeah, it, it, we we have actually looked at ways of reallocating within the stadium. Uh, you know, part of the problem is that people would have to be moved, and people don't like being moved, as we've heard tonight. So, uh, c certainly a possibility. Yeah. Take the one in Bobby's corner. <laughs> uh, thanks for that question. Um, we, uh, we've been going for an hour, so we've probably got about another 15 or so minutes. That guy there. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll ask one, and then we'll come back, if that's all right, which has come in, because there's a few, <laughs> few of these. Um, and it is one I suppose all of us could go for. So it's um, where have we budgeted to finish this season? <laughs> budgeted to finish? Well... Your, results, and then your results are a combination of what you spend and what you've got and the brains. So, you know, I don't. I think we're going to finish. Actually, I'm not going to say because I'm no expert. Uh, so, but the budget isn't what determines the results. The budget is an input. We've learned that over the last two years. We said explicitly when we started on this uh, mission to get to the championship that we weren't going to do it by spending money. The money that we've spent in the club has gone into durable assets. It's gone into the property outside there, it's gone into buying Harpers, it's gone into expanding the outside realm, it's gone into finding stuff that will endure. The other place where we've invested explicitly over the last uh, four or five years has been in human capital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were one of the few clubs in League One with a director of football. And I think we were probably the only one with one. Actually, I think Barry Fry's got more experience than you, but. I'd rather have Neil. <laughs> um, but we have, we have invested in human capital. We've got, we, we've got one of the, uh, certainly in League One, we had one of the biggest, most expensive uh, coaching staffs. Uh, I think we've got one of the highest quality coaching staffs around. And that enables us to buy players, to invest in players, and make them better players, and increase the value, uh, at the value of our squad. So it's not going to be just about spending more money on the football budget. It's going to be the combination of how much we spend and how smart we are. And here's the smart one. Uh, I think you just said it. So uh, we will have uh, one of the lowest budgets in the, in the championship, OK? Uh, which doesn't surprise you. Uh, but just to reinforce what Simon said, we take great pride in try, trying to outthink people just to try to find an edge. That might be about data, that might be about research in other areas, that might be about signing a player that nobody else has really looked at. That's where we think we can succeed. So last year, although Simon and Andrew might disagree, we had the 14th biggest budget in League One. Disagree. And finished first. Okay, so, so uh, it can be done. Luton Town would be a fantastic example of what can be done. Uh, is there a correlation between budgets and success? Yeah, of course there will be. But that doesn't mean to say that we can't succeed in our way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, ju just two extra things. Firstly, the guy who does the data at uh, Luton, Jay Socek, was the founder of the first consultant that we used when we first started using data analytics here. So, you know, we know what Jay knows. <laughs> Um, the second thing is that Neil mentioned the correlation between what you spend and what you get in terms of points. And in all of the uh, top four divisions of English football, the correlation is lowest in the bottom half of the championship. So to achieve our ambitions for next year, which are basically to survive, um, it's not all about, it's, it's, it's the least about money of any of the uh, divisions. So you know, I think we've got a very good chance. Okay. We're not just going to try and just survive. Uh, let, let's be absolutely clear. Shuey's mindset is not that. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're thinking about just surviving, you'll probably get relegated. Okay. So we aim to do better than that. Now, I'm not going to give you a number of points. I'm not going to give you a, a finishing position. 
but I promise you our ambitions are not just to survive. Okay, leave that with you. Okay, yeah, some questions from the audience in front of us here. Ali, yeah. Good evening. Um, it's been an amazing window for Argyle uh, with the return of Azaz, Whitaker, and Mumba, uh, amongst others. If you had been offered this transfer window at the start of the pre season, would you have taken it or could it have been improved in any way? And whilst that's a pure football question, I'd be interested in Simon's point of view as both a fan and also, dare I say it, as the money man. You better go first. Um, <laughs> we need another striker, don't we? Ah. <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's me as a fan. Um, I've been delighted with the transfer window. Otherwise, uh, you know, we really have started a new direction for Argyle investment in players. You know, we, we've set aside an amount of money that's not a budget, it's a fund. Delighted that Shui referred to it as a fund this afternoon. And, you know, I'm in the business of fund management and we try to increase the value as the years go by. So, you know, that's what we think we can do. Um, I would have liked to have seen more in more players in the fund, but you know today's reality is that you you have to pay what the market demands. I think the two players that we've spent most of the fund on are, as a fan, I mean, what do I know about football? I think they're wonderful, but they meet all our criteria. You know, just just go and watch them in their press conference this afternoon. I mean, these are wonderful young men. Um, so yeah, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Uh, not just at the two high-profile ones, but as some of the smaller ones. I don't spend much time chatting with the players, but just as it was last year, they, we've got a bunch of really, really good characters, which I think, um, as Shui was talking about last night, you know, when thinking about who to recruit, the character comes first, and I think uh, that really shines throughout our squad. So, so I'm delighted. Uh, so am I. I think it's been a fantastic transfer window for us. Uh, we have got a little bit more to do yet. Uh, I keep looking at this phone because I'm hoping I'm about to say, excuse me, but it's not quite that. It was the missus. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we, if we can get those last couple of bits uh, of business over the line, then I think you'll all be very pleased. We certainly will be delighted. Uh, and I want to thank Simon and Jane, wherever Jane is, I saw before, uh, for, for the backing that uh, you give us, uh, the challenge that you give us sometimes. Uh, but without an owner like Simon, without a board, without a CEO like Andrew Parkinson, uh, I'm telling you, this club would not be as far on as what it currently is. Uh, we're very lucky. So thank you. Thank you. I think we can take a, a couple more questions from the floor. I'll let you decide, Rob, over this side, potentially. Hello. Um, is the lack of uh, reserve team football a concern? Uh, absolutely not, no. So uh, one of the things that occurs to me uh, nationally is that Reserve teams are full of young players who have no future at their football clubs. So our model is as follows. We have an academy which is improving year on year on year, which runs from nine years of age to 18. If, and we have a couple of examples that you'd be aware of, uh, that the manager, Shuey, uh, and myself feel can go straight alongside the first team group, that's the actual best pathway. If we feel that some are not quite ready but need another experience, then we use the local team such as Torquay, where Will Jenkins Davis has gone to, Tiverton, et cetera, et cetera, the others, where they play with men. They don't play with uh, their own age at 20, 21 years of age. Uh, if we had the people from Arsenal and Manchester United and Chelsea, they would tell you that their youngsters go stale. 
because the challenge at under 21, reserve football, if you like, isn't real. Our youngsters are getting reality, playing for Parkway, three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, getting uh, to learn about... It's no one from Parkway in the audience, is there? <laughs> uh, learning the dark arts, Mr. Hallett said. Uh, a different environment, shall we say. That's invaluable in their education process. Uh, now, if they can jump as Freddie Asaka looks as though he can do, straight from the youth programme into the first team, that's euphoric for us and for our academy, OK? Not, not because it saves money or anything like that, just because it ticks every box. Local person, playing on home park in front of the fans, and most important of all, contributing to the first team success, we hope. But that doesn't happen every single year. We, we hope that we can do it every year, but the reality is not quite every year. So do I worry about there being no reserve team? Absolutely not. Thank you very much for that. Any others? Yes, go, Ali. Uh, going back to the youth team, will developing the Brookfield site be enough to take it to the youth level, to the Category 2 category? You should have been in our discussion this afternoon. Uh, it's going to certainly help us uh, on the following basis. So right now, uh, our academy teams are like nomads. They play all over Plymouth, all over Devon. Uh, if you're Phil Stokes, who's our academy manager, organising that on a day-to-day -day basis is incredibly difficult. So what Brick Brickfields will give us is a home for all our players from as young as six and seven when they'll start to come in through to when they progress to the first team environment. That alone will give us a better chance. Uh, so will it help? Yeah, very much so. It's definitely a key ingredient and added to that, I think uh, the games programme that we will endeavour to, to develop and where Evergreen does come in is absolutely critical. So playing higher academies um, is really important. So, you know, that the, um, the lads did very well in the Milk Cup recently. We've got to be able to compete in more of those types of tournaments. So I think that's another added ingredient to how we progress and how we make the academy progress and for the future of the first team as well. Thank you very much for that. Do you have a question? Yeah. Do you want to get the microphone from Ali? I saw, I saw you itching. All right, so I have a question about that corner in the end. Um, for, for disability people, if they have nothing to do or just want to get involved with the football team, maybe get like that corner for the disabled people. I know you've got them around the Mayflower and like the lower bit, but um, maybe get you can trap more of them. Are you talking about Bobby's Garden? <laughs> this corner yeah, here, as we know. Right. Yeah, it, yeah, I think um, the solution for Bobby's Garden is not a straightforward one. And in the long term, we definitely have to look at corners, etc. In the short term, one of the problems we've had is a clearing it. There's lots of cables, wires, all sorts of things there. And then there's access and egress getting in and out of it. It's massively difficult and challenging to do that. So I think it's a really good idea that you, you put forward and something we look at perhaps in a different way. In the, in the short term, I think we're going to cover it up. Um, that's, that, that's the plan. So at least it looks better. But I take your point, and it's a really good one for how we might be able to use it in different ways or um, be able to develop that in different ways. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't know if you know, but uh, our, we, our fans in wheelchairs are partly, if they want to be, they're kind of scattered, as you say, in front. And they ba basically can sit over there if they want to. But we have a fantastic viewing platform that was part of the refurbishment of this grandstand. And um, I think they're very happy sitting there, some of the best seats in the house. Thank you very much. Yeah, any more? Come over here. Probably take two or three more, I reckon. OK, thank you, uh, first of all, for all what you guys are doing. It's an amazing job so far, and a long may it continue. Um, in terms of the Devonport end, as we all know, it's a bit of a raucous end and problem with the standing stuff. So are you going to be looking at the safe standing for the Devonport end and possibly the Barn Park end? Because the away fans tend to, like most of ours, don't sit at away grounds. And um, often, uh, also, fan experience underneath Devonport end and Linda's 
is there a potential of a small stage or something for a, a local band underneath for music before the games or whatever like you are with the Mayflower in the future or outside of that to give a bit more for the fans on that side? I think uh, it's probably one of those that's on the list as well. So safe standing is definitely something that uh, we've already started looking at. Um, but I think we've got to put it in when it becomes a priority for us. Um, obviously, we want to keep the sort of atmosphere that we do have um, in the Devonport. Um, and it's a tricky one at the moment because there are those who want to sit and those who want to stand, of course. Um, I think we'll cross the bridge when we need to. So in terms of some of the things we've already mentioned, they pro they're probably a bit higher up the list. But nonetheless, we've kind of got a plan of everything that needs to be done, which will all come together and, and we'll have a sort of timeline for it and obviously tell everybody, communicate, engage with supporters about what they want, etc. in the right time. As for um, entertainment, I think we've got to look at it right across the whole of the ground. So we talked today um, about uh, the fan park the fan park outside the Mayflower, but we need to have that on a, a broader scale. Um, you know, these days, I think, and we saw it, didn't we, when we had the miss of football during COVID, I think what we've seen is people are coming earlier and people want to come earlier. And to do that, I think you've got to have a variety of different things. So, you know, there's entertainment, there's big screens, uh, there's things for the kids, there's all sorts of things. And I think it comes back to that that um, example I gave of you know uh, acquiring the land that we have done, it gives us the ability to be able to do that. Um, the Lindhurst is one area, but also what we can do at Har Harpers on a match day as well is another thing. So I think that whole experience is, is really important. Thank you very much. Yeah, Ali, over there. A couple of weeks ago, um, I went into the club shop and I looked around and I thought, that's a nice hat. So I thought, how much is that? And it was 11 pounds. So I went and I said, can I have the hat please? And she said, yes. I said, how much is it? And she said, 11 pounds. I then went next door to the ticket office and said, can I have my ticket please for the Leighton Orient game? And they said, yes, certainly you can. I said, that's 11 pounds. And she said, no, it's not, it's 12 pounds 50. So I said, how, how can that be right? It's a piece of cardboard. Next door, they're selling things for £11 that cost £11. <laughs> Why is this piece of cardboard costing £1.50 more than what it says on the ticket? So the silence, the silence from everyone else on, on the, uh, the group here means probably I'll take this one up. So, um, so I, I guess what you're, in a cryptic way, talking about is the fact that there's an administration charge on top of the ticket, which Absolutely. is £1.50. So, um, so uh, that is, um, first of all, in terms of the, the charge, it isn't to make a profit. It is to recognise the costs of how we have to deal with, the, with the, the tickets. We've put in the minimum costs that we can do. So, you know, you'll know in events and lots of other places, entertainment venues, football clubs, etc., that um, there is a fee attached to that. There's processing costs. There's ticket costs that we get from Ticketmaster. And we want to be, we've talked about being sustainable. Somewhere we've got to recognise those costs. Now, appreciate that you don't see that, that, I'm, that I'm cost, but... Happy. I'm quite happy to pay £12.50 for a ticket. I went to the cinema yesterday. I bought the ticket, it was £8.95. And I said, how much is the ticket? And she said, it's £8.95. It includes a 90 pence charge. I know when I buy it, how much it's going to cost. There is no way at all of buying a ticket at face value. Why have a face value that you cannot buy a ticket? We're trying to be transparent here. Yeah. We're trying to let you know the price of the ticket and the price of the uh, uh, service charge. Yeah, I, I, I don't I mean, see. We could, we could just bundle it up, but then. I don't, I don't see that it costs £1.50 for me to go up to a ticket office. Well, you don't see the processing charge the Ticketmaster imposes on us. So, uh, right, so it's Ticketmaster. Because Ticketmaster charged me 75p online. Well, there, there's lots of things attached to doing the tickets. There's, there's that, the, the processing of the tickets, there's the staffing of the tickets, there's everything that goes with that. So, you know, as Simon says, 
we've tried to be transparent and say that there's a charge attached to the distribution of that ticket, the processing of the ticket, um, which I think, you know, is pretty common everywhere. I, I, I understand that it's common. I understand that it's common. I was just surprised that this year, when there's a cost of living crisis, we've suddenly, and it is suddenly, after 137 years of not doing it, this year we have. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, we're not going to finish on that. Um, we'll, we'll wrap it up with, uh, I'm seeing a lot of new shirts around here. That's another, uh, another thing that has uh, absolutely flown out along with tickets this year and season tickets. So Andrew and or Simon, um, could, you, could you give us an update on how retail has gone? especially with shirts this year? Uh, well, I think everyone would say all the kits. Well, you've had a teaser of the third, I think. Um, I've been fantastic, haven't they? Um, you know, I think um, in some um, quarters that it's seen the first uh, team kit is seen as one of the best kits uh, you can get. So it's been lauded up. Of course, if we do very well, it'll be even better. Um, but sales have been phenomenal. Um, so in this uh, first month of sales for the first team kit. We've sold as many first team kits as we did all of last year. So that uh, is unbelievable. So thank you. Uh, so we're ordering some more, obviously. Um, so I think the next lot, the next batch um, will be coming in November, which is earlier than last year where we had a similar problem when we kind of... Uh, we increased the volume that we ordered this year, and of course, uh, once again, it's been really successful. So it's been really fantastic. So thank you, everyone, for your support. And of course, it will be on show, the green one, on Saturday. And Simon, we'll finish with you just on on how uh, how you'll be feeling on Saturday, having overseen this journey up to the championship, and it it becomes a reality against Huddersfield. I'll be terrified. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just no. <laughs> it's uh... end with that. Well, you know, I mean, you're kind of excited about it. Um, I, excited but terrified and nervous. I really, really want us to get off to a good start, you know, with Neil Warnock coming and everything. It's such a great story. It's going to be a fantastic afternoon, but it's going to be very nerve-wracking. <laughs> can, we, can we be 3 nil up at half-time, please? <laughs> I mean, no, normally you say, uh, ask me at 5 o'clock, but it might be 6 o'clock now. <laughs> sure. True. Very good. Well, thank you very much to Andrew, to Simon and to Neil. Thank you to all of, of you as well who've come out, asked some incredibly good, thoughtful, challenging questions. I hope that, we, they, that we've been able to answer it. And thanks for everybody watching at home as well. Uh, it's great to, to have you with us and contributing with questions yourselves. So thanks a lot. See you all on Saturday, no doubt. It's going to be a great season. And just a reminder that the bar will be open until 9.30 and then shut and kick out time. And then you can come back on Saturday and do it all again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.